It's always fun on the Stay Off My Operating Table podcast to introduce people to the audience who you've probably never heard of and should. Today's podcast is not that. Today we have Dr. Eric Berg, who probably has a larger audience already than any guest we've ever had on this show. So if you don't know Dr. Berg, you're in for a treat. And if you do know Dr. Berg, I think you're going to hear some things today that maybe you've never heard before. I was fascinated. I wanted more. You will too. Enjoy. He was a morbidly obese surgeon destined for an operating table and an early death. Now he's a rebel MD who is fabulously fit and fighting to make America healthy again. This is Stay Off My Operating Table with Dr. Philip Ovedia. Well, hey folks, it's the Stay Off My Operating Table podcast with Dr. Philip Ovedia. We're glad you're here. And today we are talking to, yeah, Phil, this is your job. Tell us who we're talking to. <laughs> yeah, we got, we got a great one today. Been excited for this conversation for quite a while. If anyone goes onto YouTube and just types in keto, you're most likely going to see his face first and foremost, unless it's, you know, being suppressed as it sometimes is. And we're going to talk about all that as well. But Eric Berg is really one of the, you know, OGs of our modern keto, low carb environment, and really been innovative and out there. Social media built one of the largest audiences, I think, of anyone on social media in this space. So really excited. And more importantly, I've gotten to know Eric personally over the past few months, which has really been a pleasure as well. So with that, Eric, for anyone in our audience who doesn't know you, and I'm not sure how that could happen, but give us a little bit of your background and how you got to be where you are today. Hey, thanks. It's a pleasure to be on, on your show. And I was very sick, very sick and in college, had ulcers. You know, I started getting, trying to, tried everything, every single diet you can imagine. I was doing colonics i was doing ear candle i was doing everything i could to try to get well I've done ear candles have you done that <laughs> yeah it's, it didn't work it didn't pull, pulling all that wax out didn't really help me so i stumbled <laughs> on a book uh, called i think it was called beating the zone or something with the zone diets right so i just read the first chapter and it said something about this insulin thing you know i studied this in school went to chiropractic college i went to pre-med is before that but and uh, you know didn't connect the dots when I was in school. The problem in school is that you get through it, but you don't really apply anything until you graduate. So then I started looking at this insulin thing and I started changing my diet. And it was so dramatic with the brain fog and my arthritis and my digestion that I just got really excited about this area. So dove in, started to work with my patients. I was before that, I was the sickest patient I had. People be coming in complaining about their problems. And I mean, I, I didn't, I don't tell anyone this, but I literally had a, a pizza crust right around my waist. And my, I remember walking in one of these stores and I had his t-shirt. My wife said, what has happened to you? What, why don't you do something about that? <laughs> so I was trying, you know, I was, you know, I mean, some people have greater weight problems than I do, but anyway, it was a situation where I started getting into it and then applied it to my body. And then I also stumbled onto this thing called intermittent fasting. And one thing led to another and you know, I've been in practice for 30 years. I have been out of practice probably for 10 and doing YouTube primarily. We have about 6,000 videos. I We get 28 million subscribers. So we're different languages. So we're trying to, our goal is just to help as many people as possible using things that really work with your diet. So that's kind of my short story in a thumbnail sketch. Well, Phil, I want to ask I want to follow up on something that, that you mentioned just before we started recording about the opposition. Somebody who's got an audience as big as you do, Dr. Berg, is going to attract, um, it's going to attract flack. And I need to hear more about that. What's going on? You know, here I am, I'm very much against refined carb, sugar, junk food. So you can imagine there's some pretty big industries behind that, right? So I in, in in social media, I used to dominate so many topics all across the board for years. 
I mean, just, I mean, the whole page, because I guess a lot of people didn't do videos on that. So it wasn't just the ketogenic diet. It was data on gallbladder and all sorts of things. So I built up a big audience. So what they've done last, I think it was last May. Yeah, it was May. They introduced a new policy with YouTube and they partnered with certain medical institutions because they want to just, you know, use... COVID for all the misinformation. So they want to filter out all the misinformation. And, and when they did that, they included everything, alternative, the diets, natural remedies, folk medicine, relaxation techniques, everything. So when you type on these keywords now, you'll see uh, a bunch of medical health sources, which basically have no clue what's what's going on with these topics, like, especially if you're typing like the ketogenic diet or low carb. Now, because people have been, you know, when they search, they a lot of times they'll search Dr. Berg and the topic, so they'll find me. So I still have a lot of views, don't get me wrong. But if you try to type in anything on keto or low carb, it's very difficult to find anyone who used to rank before. And so, and it's mostly negative. It's mostly negative. You know, keto is dangerous. So what's happening is that there's definitely this this back-end agenda to give keto a black eye, not just that, but just kind of create doubt in the minds of people. When they think keto, they think it's dangerous. Now, Dr. Phil and I did a, a convention several weeks ago, and I left that convention in Boca, got in the cab with someone who apparently is watching my channel, but didn't look like he was applying anything because he was literally <laughs> probably three or 400 pounds. But he said, you know, I was going to apply it, but I was a little nervous to start keto because I've heard so many dangerous things. I said, I just talked about that at the convention. So there was a lot of misinformation being put out in the name of misinformation. I mean, it's just ridiculous. So, you know, if you start keto, you might lose weight, you might feel better, you might have better blood sugars, but we don't know what's going to happen long-term. So it's kind of putting these little doubts in your mind. And it's interesting because when you see some bad news on keto, all of a sudden it's like the news picks it up. We have this keto-like diet now that's dangerous to your heart. And of course, it's not even the ketogenic diet. It's basically, it's a high carb, it's a high fat, high carb diet. So, you know, it's just, it's purely observational studies, questionnaire studies, a lot okay. of BS. Don't talk about, uh, we've covered this before, but my brain just doesn't hold these kind of things because I'm not required to, to remember it. What is an observational study? It's a, it's a very low level, low credibility study where you're taking, it doesn't show, show that it, any causation, it's some association. So they'll pick a variable. So out of all the things that they've done this, these questionnaires and they get people to uh, fill out these questionnaires like, hey, what did you eat in the last year? T you know, write all this stuff down and they'll pick, they can pick, well, it's probably low carb and they'll take a certain variable. I mean, how do we know it's not something else like smoking or some other pre existing problem or stress or all the sugar? So they kind of, they can cherry pick certain variables to make a study look in, in a certain way. So they, they could say that the, this may increase the risk of something, but that's just, it may not too. <laughs> so it's just really ridiculous. So again, you okay, can- the, op the observational studies are the ones where they basically say, hey, keep track of what you eat yes. and, and turn it in. And then we're going to do our data analysis magic and decide that well, I don't even think, we're trying I don't to even, prove. So- so Phil, I don't even think it's that. They don't even keep track, do they? It's just, you just, you fill it out and maybe at several times during the year. Okay. Yeah. Remember what you ate? Yeah, exactly. They're usually using what are called food frequency questionnaires. So, you know, it might be once a year, it might be a couple of times a year. And they'll say in the past year or in the past six months, you know, how many times have you eaten this category of food? And of course, most of us can't remember what we ate yesterday let yeah. alone accurately judge, you know, what we've eaten over the past six months. And it, it gets even more nefarious about this because, you know, they'll intentionally lump things together 
in these categories. So for instance, and, and you know, someone posted this yesterday on social media, within this fruit frequency questionnaire, for instance, it has, you know, butter, margarine, and vegetable oils all in one category. And I'll say, how often have you used this in the past, you know, three months, six months, whatever it is. And then when, you know, if you associate negative effects with that category, they'll always go to, well, it must be the butter, right? Yeah. It can't be the right. other stuff that they've lumped together in that category. So that's why these studies are so problematic. I wanted to get your thoughts, though, Eric, on why do you think, you know, keto low carb in particular is repeatedly targeted like this? Think about what keto tells people to do. Think about what kind of foods we're telling people not to eat. You're talking 87% or 83% of all the calories in the grocery store, not keto. So you could see there's a food aspect to this. There's also a very large new agenda coming out. I'm sure you're aware of they called the planetary health diet that they're coming up with where they want everyone to be on this one diet, which is sponsored by Nestle and I think, I don't know how many different drug companies. I'm like, wait a second, what are the largest junk food companies in the world sponsoring or partnering with this new diet that, that doesn't even allow you to eat much meat? I think you could have a half an ounce of beef, one fourth of a cup, or a, a, a stick of bacon. You can have a fifth of an egg a day. So it's really low on the protein, but you can have 800 calories of grains. You can have quite a few calories of seed oils. You can have seven and a half teaspoons of sugar. So they're trying to push everyone into this one bucket. Now, at the same time... Sounds like that bucket is the grave. <laughs> yeah. And at the same time, all these companies who sell beef are hedging, and they're actually selling not just plant-based meat alternatives, but they're working on another project, and it's uh, lab-grown meats. Okay, that's, this is like huge. Like the, they're, all these companies have billions invested into having these lab-grown meats. So you could you can imagine coming into a grocery store and everything is not just ultra-processed, it's all synthetic, you know? So they want to come up with this, but they have a big problem. The demand, to try to create the demand. First of all, people don't like bugs. They don't want to eat bugs. They don't want to, they don't actually are not going for the plant-based uh, meats. And now this lab-based thing. So I think, unfortunately, this pilot that they're trying, I think it's not going to work because they're going to try to get people to eat that, but I don't think they're going to do that because first of all, I think Phil and I know that you're going to get sick when you eat it. It's going to create nutritional deficiencies. It's it's not the same. Like they're saying, it's all identical to meat because it's manufactured with a certain microorganisms, genetically modified organisms like fungus and yeast. They're actually making this, making these proteins. So Again, it's just un it's going to be a a bad experiment going wrong. But this is there's a lot of money involved, and they have all sorts of organizations that are pushing this in the name of climate change too, because they want to get rid of the cows. So they want to take these farmers and actually buy up their land and buy pay the farmer not to farm, and then it's called rewild, so they can take basically their farm and turn it into a woods. I mean that's like their goal. A certain groups. I mean, it sounds just almost ridiculous, but this is kind of the plan. This is, and we're, keto's kind of in the way because we're recommending meat, which by the way is, you know, it's just, it's almost like opposite day because one of the greatest things you can eat to heal your body is beef, red meat. So. Yeah. And ultimately, you know, I think another reason it's targeted so much keto low carb is because it works and exactly people will figure this out, you know, quite honestly, you know, you, you, I mean, you have, you know, 28 million people on your channel and a lot of those people have come and they've watched a few videos and they've tried it and they've had spectacular success. So there has to be the only way to keep that you know, kind of under wraps and suppressed is to, you know, yeah, spin up this massive campaign to try and discredit it. Because more and more, you know, when people try it, it works. And, you know, so they have to try and discourage like your taxi driver, 
they have to discourage people from trying it because once they try it, it becomes pretty hard to convince them not to do it. You're spot on. It's the reason why it's being attacked is because it works so well. I'm talking about, I mean, you're in the medical community. You, they don't, they don't really emphasize diet. It's not relevant. It's not, does it's not put at the top of the list as far as things to look at when you're evaluating for heart disease and stuff. So, I mean, from my viewpoint, I mean, you put someone on this eating plan, you just turn their whole health around and guess what? They're probably not going to need as many medications. So it's definitely, it is a powerful tool that can help so many people. So you can imagine it's, there's a lot of people are against this. I mean, it's think about how many people, I don't know. I'm, I have about almost 8,000 success stories on my website. And if you read these, how many people have no longer need their medications? I mean, it's just, you know, thousands and thousands of people that need less and less medications, if anything. So it's a game changer. And of course, you know, there, this is really, it's pretty obvious what's happening. They, I mean, keto is creating a, a big problem. It's a disruption into the whole, the whole medical system, really. And then they got, you know, you have people that invest in YouTube, Google and YouTube, you know, they're very large with just a lot of dollars going on into that area. So they're, you know, invested in big farm and stuff like that. So it's just kind of, they're coming in there and they have to do something about it. Even the largest pasta, I talked about that, the largest pasta company in the world was really nervous as soon as keto came out and it was so popular. It was the popular, is it's still the most popular diet out there, but it was actually even more popular a few years ago and they were just shaking their boots. And so a lot of companies, lost a lot of money and you can see the trends. And so they started to come up with all these keto recipes. In fact, I remember this was five years ago, this company wanted me to do a, a webinar on keto and I didn't really, it was a food company. It was, a, it was, they made certain type of dairy products. I didn't know any, I didn't know why, but there was other manufacturing companies on that webinar. I talked all about it. And then I, when I was done, I said, who was on this list? It was pretty much every single big food company. They just wanted to get more information on what is this keto diet. I actually, I did the webinar on that. So, but they didn't initially tell me who was listening. But yeah, so they're very aware of what's happening. And they try to create some products, but they don't really have the trust. You know, you look at these ingredients and it's not even keto. It's ridiculous. Yeah. And again, I think that's sort of an intentional effort. You know, they've created this whole cottage industry of what I call keto junk food. And so, you know, they steer people towards this and people say, you know, those are the people who I see, you know, they say, well, I'm doing the keto diet and it's not working. And the reason it's not working is because you're still eating the junk food. It's just labeled differently. And I think, again, it's an attempt for these food companies to kind of corrupt corrupt the diet, corrupt the results that people get from this dietary approach. And I see that as a very intentional effort. Yeah. Yeah. I was, I, I went to Walmart and I was looking at these foods. I was making notes of some of the larger, the brownies and all these just different junk foods in there. They say keto on there. And I'm like, wait a second, this is not keto. This is, and so they're trying, but you know, it's just, it's not going to help people. They're, they're not going to, lose weight on it. I mean, even look at Atkins, some, all the Atkins diets. I mean, if Atkins was still alive, he would, he would just really not be happy with, with those ingredients that are in his products. Exactly. This reminds me, this reminds me that I was working in the IT industry a long time ago in the, the mid eighties and worked for a company that uh, sold everything computer related. And it was the it probably one of the first times that the phrase artificial intelligence gained popular currency. And it was really funny because back in those days, kids, you bought software in a box and it came with a diskette and you, and you don't know anything about any of that stuff. But what these manufacturers of software did was many of them literally just printed a sticker and put a sticker on the box that said, now with AI, now with artificial intelligence. And we had the whole heart healthy thing. They did the same thing with the labeling. 
you know, whatever food you have now, it's heart healthy. It's just grab a word, stick it on the, you know, label it and nothing changes. It's, it, it's I'm struggling here because I hope we don't, there, there's a very obvious problem that we, everybody who's in this community wants to try to address and deal with. And that's that we're fighting giant corporations who really don't care about anything except the next quarterly profit report. And yet the people who are benefiting from our show and shows like yours are desperately in need of help in getting healthy. So I want to ask this question, and it's not intended to be provocative. It's just there's going to be folks who get the message from big food and big pharma and big everything else that, oh, don't do this. It's dangerous. So let's address it. There are, in fact, some folks who really do try to follow a ketogenic way of eating, do it right, and have problems. Can you talk about what the characteristics of those folks are who try it and don't succeed so that folks can self-identify? Maybe I need to, to do something different. Does my question make sense to you? Yeah, I think this kind of rolls right into the next topic that we are going to cover, which before we jump in there, I think First of all, if you look up ketogenic diet, there's many different types of the ketogenic diet because really the ketogenic diet is just low carb. So you have the classical ketogenic, ketogenic diet, which is in the hospital they use with epileptic patients, which literally, if you look at that diet, yeah, that would make you sick. I mean, it's, yes, it might be low carb, but they're using seed oils, they're using powdered proteins in, in a can, so I always like the healthy version of the ketogenic diet. That's what I talk about. So there, if you do just low carb, they don't really, you know, keto doesn't talk about the quality of your fat. You could literally be keto and just do all seed oils and fat. And so that's one of the problems is a person trying to do keto and understanding how to do it healthily. Also, when you get on the ketogenic diet, the demand for certain vitamins go up like the B vitamins. Now, also when you do a high carb diet, the B vitamins go up too. So you can, if you know the pitfalls you take your, you know, if you consume more salt, for example, really important because you lose a lot of water weight initially. And, and so I think those people that might have reactions, which is actually a lot fewer than you think, I think probably the biggest thing is they might get discouraged because either they might hit a plateau or they might, someone discourages them because they said, oh, you're doing the ketogenic diet? Oh, I heard that was dangerous. Are you sure you want to do that? You know, they might get off that way. But for the most part, I would say, because I work with tens of thousands of people for a long time on this, you put them on this, even a version of it, they get the results, they're sticking with it because it works and it gets rid of their hunger so it makes it sustainable. You know, I've heard Phil talk about that. The a diet that isn't sustainable is not going to work. No right. matter no matter what kind of success you may have short term. It's got to be something you can becomes a lifestyle. Yeah. Yeah. And and unfortunately, you know, as you mentioned, oftentimes the people discouraging them from the diet, despite the success that they may have gotten are, are going to be medical professionals. You know, there's oh, right. a lot of misunderstanding in the medical community about what this diet does, what this dietary approach entails and what it does. And these perceived effects that, you know, we always hear about, but, you know, those of us that are actually working with patients, you know, following this dietary approach, you know, we never see it. You know, there were, there was a big one a few years ago about the keto crotch, you know, that you supposedly got <laughs> and, you know, talking to all of, you know, my colleagues, all of the practitioners, I'm like, has anyone ever actually seen a case of this? And no one ever has. So we, you know, no idea where that even came from. And of course, you know, the perceived risks around heart disease are a big one that come up that we spend a lot of time trying to dispel for the people who are hearing this other information. 
you know, certainly, and, you know, this is the topic, another topic we wanted to get into, certainly there's nuance to this approach, like there always is. And, you know, having better ways of assessing, you know, why patients may not be getting the success that they're looking for is, you know, a valuable tool to us practitioners. And you've talked recently about one of those tools that's really you know, being explored and being understood. And it's called metabolomics. And I'd like to get into what that is and how it can help us better understand, you know, how to refine some of these dietary approaches. So give us the basics first. What is metabolomics and how can it be useful in these situations? Metabolomics is the one of the fastest researched new technologies, but it's been around since the 60s. But it's the study of metabolites. Now, what does that mean? What is a metabolite? Those are small molecules. So we, you've heard of the genome, right? The genome was supposed to revolutionize medicine. Oh yeah, we figured this out, and you know. But that just looks at your weaknesses within the genes or your strengths in the genes. But then those genes get transcribed into proteins and enzymes, which then, which are the metabolites. So now we're looking at the 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 chain the end value of that, the gene in relationship to your environment. So if you were to go to get a doctor and get a blood test, you know, and they look, oh yeah, you have high LDL or you have high blood glucose, right? Now, if we compare now getting a metabolomic test, you're looking at 3000 different molecules and you're not even, it's not even about those molecules. You're able to look at the entire assembly line the, the pathway, the biochemistry in a whole dynamic way. So you're actually getting a picture of what's really happening behind the scenes. And that's really the problem with someone having this, wow, your LDL is high, but that doesn't really tell you why. So with the metabolomics, you get a visual of what's happening in the mitochondria, for example. You can look at each different assembly it's like if it's like a factory right you have this assembly line and you have each person on there you have the raw material coming in and then we end up with atp so to be able to visualize each step you can now pinpoint a lot better what the heck's going on what's causing the problem and then you can predict it as you know it takes decades for diabetes to develop and checking someone's blood sugar doesn't tell you what's happening way before it Scene. So with metabolomic testing, you could see the early start of diabetes very easily. You could see, you can correlate someone's LDL with all these other factors with insulin resistance to see if this is a, is this a problem or not? And then you can actually, it's individualized. So we're testing you not against a huge other population. We're checking you over time to see what your body needs. So instead of looking at like a vitamin C level, we're looking at how your body is using vitamin C for what you need and your demand for that nutrient. If we take magnesium, it's involved in 300 different enzyme reactions. You, you don't have to look at every single one of those, but you can look at several pathways involved with magnesium and you can get an idea if you're sufficient in a certain nutrient. So what's really fascinating about this metabolomics is I think it's going to be medicine of the future, because this is going to really show someone what diet that they need and what version of a diet that they need. So there's a little bit of biochemistry to learn on this, but to be able to just take one little piece of this and look at your mitochondria and look at the pathways and, and visualize what's happening is extremely valuable. I know in when I was in practice, I would send people out for blood tests all the time and look at their nutrient levels in the blood, but that doesn't, that it was, it was still in a mystery about what's going on deeper. So this really gives us a, a snapshot in time of what's happening with someone's health. And we're not looking at the genes. We're looking at how your environment, your diet, your stress level exercise is interacting, interacting with your genes real time. And uh, you, I know you are probably going to talk about the microbiome, which is a whole different, that's really complex, right? And I don't think anyone has that 
even close to understanding of what's happening because you're dealing with a lot more factors, a lot more variables. But the metabolomics looks right into your, your biochemistry and gives us a snapshot of what's going on. And the type of fluid, you can do it with a dry blood spot test or and urine, you can do it with saliva, you can do it with all sorts of fluids. And you send it into this lab and and then you know you can target really key biomarkers. And there is a tremendous amount of correlation now with like really understanding what it means and to go from one chemical to the next with this certain enzyme. If there's a bottleneck, for example, and there's too much of something or not enough, the They've really done a lot of research now that what that what the significance of that, what that means. So when a practitioner uses that that method of evaluation, metabolomics, they can it's a wonderful test to do over time with a patient to really see the story of what's happening to them and how you can add things and take things away to see changes over time. So I want to understand this. Actually, you said a bunch of things that I, I have questions about. Yeah. First thing that I, I wanted to make sure I understood, you can get one of these metabolomic tests from, I, I spit in a tube and send it in and they can do the full test? Yeah, they can do it remotely. Because all, you know, the the doc that I'm working with, because I'm just for an experiment, I'm doing my my metabolomics every other week. You wouldn't need to do that, but I'm just doing it as a, human guinea pig because I'm trying different things and I want to see what happens. I'm just really so interested in this. I'm, I'm like studying it hardcore right now. But yeah, you uh, do a dry blood spot. So you pick your finger, get some blood on a little piece of paper, dries it. And then you actually get your urine, which tells tells you the, the byproducts of your chemistry. And you freeze it and you send it to the lab. And then it takes, you know, a week or two to get it evaluated. And then you get a report and then you get an evaluation of what's happening. So it's a, gives you a, a tremendous data on a deep dive into way, way better than just a blood test, you know? Uh, so, because so this is, I just want to make sure this is a diagnostic tool, right? Okay, so or, it's or... Not, we're not diagnosing diseases. We're looking at dysfunction and that potentially, you, then it gives you a prediction of what you could have if things keep going the way they go. Now you can pick up a lot okay, of that makes sense. diseases, but it's not necessarily, oh, you have cancer, but we could say, you know what? Your mitochondria is like not working. It's dysfunctional and you have a lot of inflammation, insulin resistance, and it also shows that you're not having enough protein. And so it just, uh, it gives you more of a dysfunctional approach where you're looking at pathways and what's working, what's not in the body. Well, let me ask an uncomfortable question then. Mm -hmm. a, a health practitioner gets this report. Is your typical primary care practitioner going to have any earthly idea what to do with most of this? <laughs> no, you have to be trained in it. You have to have someone that understands biochemistry. And this is not necessarily, I mean, you're taught in school these things, but you're definitely, it's you're not applying it. So it's a... You'd have to you'd have to take a course on it to learn what it means and how to interpret it. Many of the uh, practitioners out there are going to cringe when I say, you know, this can actually show you those steps of the Krebs cycle that we all had went through great pains to learn back in uh, medical school and hoped we'd never actually have to deal with. But it turns out that it's a pretty useful thing to understand, you know, how the mitochondria are actually functioning and to really understand where the breakdowns might be in, you know, the biochemical processes that underlie all of these diseases, you know, that we've been so focused on. So it kind of shifts the focus away from kind of the the symptom complex, the disease to, you know, what is actually mis dysfunctioning, what is misfunctioning, I guess, not functioning properly on a cellular level in our bodies. And and that's what I, I found fascinating as as I've started to learn about and, and dig into this. Is the the microbiome, an entirely different system? Because yeah. you mentioned that as well. Yes, but you can indirectly assess certain things in the microbiome. You can look at certain indicators that, which called surrogates or proxies that you can look at. 
problems with you know pathogenic bacteria missing friendly bacteria so you can also take a look at that as well using this but we're not necessarily evaluating all the microbiome because that's a whole other complex thing that it's going to take quite a bit of time to evaluate that because there's just so much there's so much data i mean think about this right we have about what 20 to 20,000 to 25,000 genes that make you know millions of proteins and that interact with each other so you have tens of millions of reactions right so metabolomics we're, we're, we narrow it down to 3,000 biomarkers so it's a lot more to wrap our wits around and then certain biomarkers are in different organs Certain biomarkers are in the mitochondria, certain ones are in the cytoplasm. So you're able to use this and plug these into the the thing that we all studied that we didn't have a clue. You know, there is just not enough time in school to really digest and, and learn this stuff. You memorize it, you get through it. And then, so this way I'm like, what I'm doing now is I'm taking each pathway and just spending time, okay, Break it down. Just like, what's what happened? What does this mean if it's increased or decreased? Okay, good. And now it's enjoyable to learn the mitochondria and the Krebs cycle. Before it was torture because <laughs> I had nothing to apply it to. So this is like very pleasurable for me. It's I look forward to it. So what are you guys as health practitioners? I mean, well, how do you move the ball down the field with this? I'm you know. I'm Joe Sixpack here. I got no earthly idea. I'm trusting you guys to be the experts. What is your reaction? How, both of you. I mean, I think I, this I, has I, to be I, simplified because it's very, you know, something that we wouldn't necessarily start teaching the average patient all this stuff. It's just something that, that I think a, a medical practitioner, if they had that tool, they can better guide a patient to instead of trying to rely on the next study, they can say, well, let's see what your body needs. And you know, maybe we need to make some adjustments on your low-carb diet or whatever you're doing, and then we can actually see the results over time. And then, because you have a lot of different differences within individuals. So, but of course we wanna keep it simple for a guy like you. We're not gonna you know, go into that much complexity. And that's really one thing that I focus on is I don't, I try not to use a lot of big words with patients because you're going to put them to sleep. Yeah, I mean, I'm optimistic that this will be, you know, will help guide us better on that individualized approach because, you know, one of the, honestly, one of the mistakes I think we've made in medicine is uh, trying to make medicine cookbook, you know, all of these guidelines and trying to, broadly apply them to, you know, across the populations and thinking that, you know, each one of us is going to react the same way is really, I think, a foolhardy approach to medicine. You know, medicine by necessity needs to be individualized and we need to figure out for that patient in front of us, you know, what is the best approach. And I think tools like this are going to help better guide us through that process. So that's what makes me optimistic and makes me think that, you know, this is going to be a vital tool moving forward. This is, this is what people want. This is, they want to know, why do I have this? They don't want just another prescription. My neighbor, for example, I think she's on 10 different, she's 36 years old. She's on 10 different medications. I'm like, we don't know. I mean, she doesn't know what's causing what, I mean, she's just getting worse and worse. So, you know, we have all these symptoms which are indicators of something else and wouldn't it be nice to go deeper and go you know we need to make some we need to work on the core problem your diet first let's work on that let's see if let's see where you're at and let's not compare you to the next person and then start to get a visual a deep dive in what's going on instead of just covering up one thing that leads to another thing and the chain reaction i mean Phil, I think you know that you start putting people on this, just the basic eating plan. I mean, the need for medication, the, the cognitive function, the, the overall mood improvements. I mean, it's just so dramatic that with metabolomics, we can actually see the see what's really happening too, why that's occurring. 
you know, so it's not just subjective. And then if someone doesn't respond like they should, you could see what's going on with their, their body, their chemistry and get a snapshot and really understand why they feel the way they feel. So, and then, cause it's always, you know, when you run into these mysteries about these patients that have weird stuff, especially now, like I have people that always say, well, what about this? And on my live show, well, what about this? I'm like, well, I wish I had a test I could do to see why you have that, you know? So I need more data. So you go get a test, go get a metabolomic test and uh, bring it back to me and let me look at it. But so it's, that's, I think going to be the future of medicine. If, if it's, if we get enough practitioners doing it, because of course you, you can imagine there's going to be a lot of people against having this implemented. And, and again, I would, the way that I think this is the best way to approach it is on a grassroots campaign and to have people, doctors just do it on their patients, get the results and not try to change the medical profession. Let the patients demand and increase demand to push the market in a different direction. But it's about time that the medical profession just has a disruption because it's too expensive right now. And it's, I don't think it's working like it should. I have so many questions I want to ask, and very few of them have to do with getting healthier. So Phil, should I keep my tongue here? Well, I'm actually kind of curious to hear where you're thinking about this. Well, because One of the things I've pondered for a long time is our model of health uh, the the dominant model of health, which is not the only model of health, but the dominant model of health seems to be entirely chemical. And I'm, I have been exposed to, over the last several years, entirely different models of health that look at health as, as, <laughs> as energy flows, for lack of a better word. I don't know a better phrase for it. And one of the things I'm wondering about is this snapshot you're talking about is simply a moment of, in time. And it seems to me that we ought to be able, we ought to be, to truly understand, we ought to be looking at moment to moment kinds of things. Obviously, we can't do that all the time. But is our model broken? Are we looking at our at health as something that's primarily just chemical? as opposed to there's this element of life to it, of energy. I, I had somebody ask me just last week, what's the difference between someone who is alive and someone and that exact same person who just died? You know, two minutes ago they were alive and now they're dead. Aside from the mechanical functions, all the matter, all the material is still there in the body. All the molecules are still there. All the chemicals are still there, but the processes that, that are life and health are gone. And I went, holy cow, that is a question. And I didn't have an answer for him. Well, you're asking some heavy questions there. I, I know. And I'm, yeah. you guys are, you guys have pushed the boundaries and. Well, obviously you have this, this life force that's animating things. I mean, you have I mean, it's fascinating when you look at, when I talk about proteins, just proteins, enzymes, you have these entire mechanical workers that are just fascinating. I mean, there are enzymes that rotate, that act like pumps. They rotate the speed of a jet engine. I mean, that just blows my mind. You have proteins and enzymes that are mechanically repairing things. You have proofreaders on your DNA strands that are scanning for errors and then going in there and fixing them. So obviously there's some fascinating, mysterious life going on in the body, which is just very interesting and wild. But I will say, <clears throat> bringing you back to earth, when you look at- I realize I'm way out in outer space here. Right. Mitochondria. I think a big misunderstanding- because you're going in, you're going in the mitochondria from this chemical factory, biochemical factory, right, and then it goes flows right into this other topic, which is physics, which is electrons. So you're extracting electrons from food to make literally batteries, which are what's called ATP. And the ATP 
is not really not a lot of it's not even stored that much even though your body makes enough atp that literally is equal to your weight at every single day so it's this fascinating biochemical process done with enzymes and things that then and then we go right into this it's called the electron chain transport or transport chain where you get all these electrons that are now doing this whole other thing and so you really need to know physics now, not just biochemistry when you're talking about mitochondria. <laughs> so it's oh, confusing great. to people, but but we do have a battery. It's an amazing electrical part of your mitochondria that you can look at some of those enzymes metabol metabolomically and see if that's where the problem is well. I mean, as you know, because most diseases are related to this mitochondria. I mean, so if you just can keep that thing healthy, you're going to, be in pretty good shape. Yeah, and I think it's a, you know, it, it is a pretty interesting dichotomy. And, you know, I, I continue to struggle with this because on the one level, you know, it, it's clearly important, you know, what's going on at that subcellular level, what the mitochondria are doing. And on the other level, you say, you know, if, if you just get out of the, you know, if we just get out of our bodies own way if we just stop poisoning our bodies you know have it figured out they know what to do and they you know they are prone towards health i guess is one of the things i've started to think about and realize and we look at it as our bodies are you know destined for disease is you know, become the the thinking these days and you know our role as medical practitioners is to fight off all these disease right. and our role as medical practitioners should be to support the normal, healthy functioning of the body. And I think that's the shift that we really need to make. And that brings us back to, you know, paying attention to basic things like what you eat and, and what you do in a day. You know, you like you, you nailed it because it's the intention. Are we treating disease? Or are we actually trying to create health, right? I mean, it's that simple. And so when you take a look at food, Let's just take a look at what is the worst thing you could do for your health out of anything. I think it's, my guess is it's called ultra processed food, AKA junk food. I don't know if there's any other thing that was worse than that, but what is ultra processed food? It is processed food. They're literally, you're taking, they're starting out with corn or something like that. And they process it so much that it no longer resembles the original structure, the chemistry of that original food. They're basically taking life out of that food. So it is so dead, even the bugs won't eat it. It has no, sh no shelf life, it'll stay in the, in the box. And that's what we're putting in our bodies. Se was it 67% of all the calories with kids are eating ultra processed foods. So we have a combination of not just sugar, but synthetic sugars. We have synthetic starches. I just did a deep dive into maltodextrin, which by the way, is a, it's not even classified as a sugar. Maltodextrin is a, a synthetic starch made from corn. It has the glycemic index can literally go up to 185. So if we just compare that to glucose, I mean, it's like way worse than glucose, which is a sugar, but it's a starch. And it can be, it's put into low carb foods. It's put into, what is it? No foods that are like, like healthy foods and uh, foods that are gluten-free. I'm like, are you kidding me? So it's a filler and it's, it, they make, it's like $15 billion a year business. And uh, that's one ingredient of this ultra processed food. And then of course you have the seed oils, right? So now we're going to, we're putting this in our body. We're literally trying to create health by giving it something dead, really dead. I don't think you can do that. That's a cool way to think about it. We're trying to create health, sustain life by doing something really dead. And that leads me to think about, all right, when I'm eating meat, specifically beef, I'm eating, I mean, I very well could be eating something that was alive with, if I had a butcher available two hours ago. I could be eating the muscle of an animal that was mooing two hours ago. It's very much 
closer to what it was when it was living. So that's an, a way I think about what it is I'm eating, like just how close to alive is this thing I'm sticking in my mouth. And that simplifies it for me, uh, which is not to say I don't love me a good Dorito every now and then, but it's become a whole lot easier to uh, to turn away from it. Than but it. when you eat a Dorito, it's really hard to just eat one because it's it leaves this emptiness it's so delicious, but it leaves this emptiness because there's just there's nothing in there for your brain to go. I feel satisfied. <laughs> I used to have the big jumbo bags, and I would down without even thinking twice a huge bag. Yeah, yeah. so thus the ulcers that I developed. But wow! So I, had, like, I, had, I had a weird experience here just in the last couple of months. I I, I eat pretty well thanks to to being the co-host of Phil's show. I feel terrible if I have crappy food, but I, I had, I think my wife broke down and bought a bag of some kind of chip that I would never eat anymore, but she was gone and I was alone. There was a football game on and I ate probably a third of that bag of chips back in the day. That would have just been, it would have been, I would have loved every moment of it. And once, when I was done stuffing my face with that stuff, I realized I feel terrible. That was not fun. I was, it was mindless. It was just, it was gross. It was kind of helpful in some ways to remind myself how bad this stuff is, but it was also quite the interesting experience to realize I used to do this all the time and was not yeah. aware how crappy it made me feel. Right. Maybe I just felt crappy all the time and it didn't change it. So Oh, gee, I, there's so yeah, many places that, I want to go here, Phil. <laughs> unfortunately, that's uh, all too common an experience that people don't realize how bad they actually feel because it's just the way they feel. And it's only when, you know, change your diet and change your lifestyle and you do start to feel how you're supposed to feel that you can then recognize how bad you felt back then. Yeah. It's, a, it's like a norm. You get used to this normal. I mean, the neighbor just decided he got sick and he says, what should I do? And I said, one thing I said, just stop drinking all the sodas. Well, that was such a big change for him. That was like, to me, I'm like, well, of course, but for him, it was the biggest thing. He, sa he says, well, I feel so much better. I said, wow, that's interesting. So I'm, you know, I think we're so used to feeling bad that we don't know what you know, you get on the ketogenic diet or a low carb diet, and then you start feeling better. I don't know if you ever heard of the story, Doc, that I had this person reach out to me. They they were suicidal, severe depression. So he decided to end his life by starving himself in his room. So he locked himself in his room. I'm just gonna not eat or drink for three or you know, until I die. <laughs> third third day of fasting, <laughs> he started to feel really good almost, wow, I just feel wonderful and I'm happy and I'm, what's going on? This is weird. He starts going on the internet, find what, oh, I was fasting. What's that? He gets on my channel, you know, he starts learning all about fasting and apparently now he has a job, changed his life, but he had no idea that depression was not normal. He didn't know the anxiety and the anger was, he just thought it was just normal and it has to be like that. So you can imagine how many people are in that same they're stuck in that trap. This is cool. This is almost like the summary episode of what the Stay Off My Operating Table podcast is all about. I realize we could go really deep into a lot of details, but this is just kind of like headlines. This is this is why we're here. This is what why we're doing this. Is this metabolic? Remind me of the name of the... My wife says metabolone, but it's metabolomics. Are there places and people that a can that Joe Sixpack here can say, "Hey, I want to do this," and then people who can read it? Is that even oh, an appropriate so there's, question there's to several, ask at this point? There's just several companies that are doing it, but there, I, I found someone in Greece that has also they have a fairly big clinic and. What I like about this doc is that not only does he have an MD and PhD in metabolomics, but 
He's also in um, Italy, and he's also creating a course, and he's converting it to English. And I was so impressed when I had my evaluations, though. You know, I'm I'm just like I'm picking his brain because he knows it, and he really is. You know, I, I'm sure there's other people that really know it as well, but I just found someone that can actually make it real and understand. He's he's been doing it for quite some time, and he has close to over 50,000 people he's done it on. So that's helpful. And he also found that some of the normals or even metabolomic testing are off. So he created his, he used certain biologists and biochemists with some of his research he did to figure out the normals because some of the normals were based on sick people that are. <laughs> so he has a really good system and I, I really... I would like to, I keep encouraging him to okay, complete that course so other docs can start learning it in English. So I can definitely share his website on in the description if, if people want to get more information. But there's other yeah. companies that well, do folks it. Folks are going to want to know. I looked at them yet. Folks are definitely going to want to know. One other, one other topic I wanted to touch on before we wrap up that you've focused on as well, I think is important to discuss is, you know, that food quality aspect. And, you know, we talk about, you know, keto, low carb carnivore diets, but even within that, you know, there, there are certainly better ways that we can be raising our food and growing our food. And I wanted to I know that's another topic that you've been interested in and, and become interested in. So let's let's talk a little bit about that before we wrap up. Yeah, I was I went to Europe and I just noticed that the food quality is so much better. And of course, wow. you go to a restaurant and I'm like, where do you get your food from? They work with 60 different farms. So, and then I want to go to other farms. So I started looking at the farms. So to make a long story short, I have a farm. I live on a farm and I <laughs> grow all my food. And so- What's interesting is I sent, I, we did metabolomic testing on the, our beef to look at the muscle, that, that animal. And about six months later, the researcher called me up and says, well, cause I entered into the study and he goes, well, what are you doing? I said, what do you mean? He goes, look at the, look at this. And if you look at the comparison with the amount of, I mean, not just metabolomic biomarkers for health, but also phytonutrients. I'm talking plant-based chemicals, polyphenols, which are in plants. It's in the beef. I mean, I'm like, what? That's wild. I never even thought that was possible, but that's what's in there. Like three times higher than any other farm in the United States. And he says, what are you doing different? Well, first of all, I didn't know at first, but we're at 3000 feet above uh, sea level. So we have more stress for plants that have to survive because they're in higher, less oxygen. So the body develops some adapts to that and it develops all sorts of positive things. It's like a hormetic effect of adding more stress. And plus there's nothing flat. There's just mountains up and down. So these cattle get a lot of exercise and, you know, of course it's grass fed, grass finished, but basically he said, you, you have, this meat is of an athlete, top athlete, because if you compare the grain fed beef, you're dealing with almost close to being diabetic, mm. marbled and just diabetic meat. So, you know, we haven't proven this yet, but I think if you eat healthier animals, I think you might be healthier. But so where do you get this? You you know, if you go to farmer's markets and you can also online and look for a certain, you know, like U.S. Wellness Meats is a good one, where you get a chance to see more transparency of who's growing these this food you know, real soils and great environment. I mean, that that's really, I think, something I'm really interested in because when people come to my farm and they I give them this meat, they just like, they just, they don't even talk. They're like, what is this? And they're like, wow, this is amazing. I feel so good when I eat this. So I'm getting used to, I'm, I'm kind of spoiled, but when I go anywhere else, I'm like, I can't even eat that. But I think we get so used to eating like just regular food, but there's different levels to take your health, you know, and I'm kind of trying to experiment with the higher level quality of food. And to do that, I'm growing it myself. So we have pigs, different types of pigs. We have goats, sheep, cattle, chickens. And so, yeah, we're doing it all and experimenting and just testing things, sending things to the lab. 
we also, and I just sent some venison in and from deer meat. And I just want to learn all about it and find out how to actually grow food healthier. Because the problem is the poor farmer has, has a hard time feeding these pigs certain food. So we're looking at alternative feeds, experimenting on that right now. And so we could figure out what can you actually feed an animal, especially even to get eggs that's that are not too high in the omega-6 fatty acids because they use grains and the grains are high in omega-6. So there are like no corn, no soy grains that you can feed these chickens. So that's one thing we're doing as well. And I have a whole additional barn where I'm, I'm sprouting like barley now and I'm feeding that to the chickens and they love it. They It's like crack. They just eat it all up. So, and it's in the winter time. So they're just eating these little sprouted barley plants and they love plus it. So, you're, plus you've got the starts for a whiskey distillery. I do that on the side as well. So oh, I can do you now. Rats. <laughs> yeah. Those okay. days, th those days are over for me. <laughs> Well, I understand. I'm trying to figure out which vices I can hold on to. And it seems like whiskey is... A, I read somewhere that whiskey is by far the best antiseptic that mankind has ever invented. Um, and yeah. I choose to believe that. So Yeah, it'll clean you right out. <laughs> Sterilize you. <laughs> Phil, you got to help me out here because we cannot yeah. end the show on that note. <laughs> No, I think this has been a, a great discussion and, you know, again, just uh, applaud all the amazing work that, that Eric's been doing and getting this message out uh, in a way that obviously resonates with people, you know, to see the evidence of his audience growing worldwide. So, you know, not that anyone's going to have any trouble finding you and probably has already found you. But if there is someone out there who hasn't come across you, where, where should they start on you all your type Dr. Research? Berg, I talk to Dr. Berg on YouTube, or you can go to drberg.com and, and then just watch videos. That's, I do a video a day because I have not all this spare time and I'm being very sarcastic, but oh, uh, yeah, so that was, that's what I was thinking. <laughs> yeah. And it's yeah. really nice to uh, that you as a vascular surgeon is are doing this education ed, educating people i mean if i don't know if i had any heart problems i would just love to go to someone like you because it's wow you're not just doing the surgery you're educating people on how to prevent the next you know these problems so i think that is I want to applaud you for that that's i wish more doctors are doing what you're doing so well done thank you thank you all right, drberg.com. We'll make sure all the ways to connect are in the show notes. This has been a good one. It's been fun. Thanks, Phil. It's been a good time. Dr. Eric Berg, thanks for being with us. Thank you. Appreciate it. Have a good one. This is the Stay Off My Operating Table podcast. We'll talk to you guys next time. Chances are you wouldn't be listening to this podcast if you didn't need to change your life and get healthier. So take action right now. Book a call with Dr. Avadia's team. One small step in the right direction is all it takes to get started. Contact us at ifixhearts.com slash talk. That's ifixhearts.com slash talk.